Yes. So um, you've got yourself into a webinar on systemic design. Um, it's going to be fun. Uh, you're going to mostly see Arash uh, and I'll be on the background. Um, Arash, maybe we can do a short intro uh, for the people who haven't seen your face uh, and don't know who you are, which I'd be very curious about because otherwise, why are they here? But anyway, could you give a brief intro? Yeah, I'm Arash Goldnam. I'm originally from Iran. I've been in Switzerland for the past 13 years. Um, originally had a background in uh, industrial engineering. So I'm an industrial engineer by training. Then I went to um, technology management systems modeling and later on did some mathematical simulation of complex and adaptive systems, a field which is called system dynamics. For the past three, three and a half years, I've been training as a psychoanalyst in Jung Institute here in Switzerland near Zurich. And I am a big fan of anything which is multidisciplinary. So I like connecting different disciplines. And I think um, design, designing is uh, one of those fields of inquiry in which uh, connection, connections across disciplines is in particular very important. And today, what we'll be talking about is actually a multidisciplinary take on, on design and going over some ideas. Um, I would like to save some time for questions, definitely. So I would not take a lot of time presenting so that we can have a lively dialogue, hopefully amongst ourselves. Awesome. Uh, and for the people who want to know more about you, you also did an intro in our episode on the Service Design Show. And that's where I'm from. So uh, if you haven't seen my face yet, I'm Mark. Hello. I run a thing called the Service Design Show, amongst uh, a few other things. Uh, and the Service Design Show is basically a platform for service designers who want to take the next step in their career, who really want to go beyond the superficial layers of service design, beyond the things you read in textbooks and find in trainings and courses and really mostly only can learn through experience. So um, making services and the world a better place, one service at a time. So that's what we try to do at the Service Design Show. Um, and as it happened, uh, Arash and I got into a conversation on the Service Design Show. I think it was episode 123 or 24, something 24. like that. 24, there you yeah. go. Uh, about a month ago. And uh, we talked about systemic design. And I found that such a fascinating topic that after an hour, I felt that we sort of just uh, began talking about the topic. And then for the first time, actually, uh, we came up with the idea to do a follow-up conversation webinar, whatever you want to call it. And here we are. So um, my role is very limited today. I'll try to uh, collect your questions because that's why we're also here and uh, forward them to Arash and try to uh, navigate and guide this conversation in a meaningful way. So the agenda is pretty simple. Um, by the way, one question, who has seen the episode with Arash? Type a yes if you have uh, seen it in the chat. Good, uh, a few people have, so that means they have some background knowledge, Arash. Uh, they're prepared. Okay. Uh, so uh, I hope you also have some questions ready, which would be awesome. Um, I don't have a lot uh, to add to this anymore. I think, Arash, you want to start by sharing a few things, and then we'll basically go into... A Q and A, right? All right. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Here we go. Let's get started, and um, let's hope for a lively conversation and a flow of ideas and meaning between us today. Um, so, instead of asking the question "What is systemic design?", I would like to ask the question "When is systemic design?". So, I will answer to this question in three chapters today. But before that, a bit about my background. Like I said, I was an industrial engineer. Um, so design means something different in the field of industrial engineering. And then I went into the field of um, systems thinking, system dynamics, which is the mathematics of systems thinking, the quantitative approach to um, systems thinking. Um, I worked as um, a system dynamicist, basically working with the simulation models of complex and adaptive systems. 
And I was working on a, uh, on a project which was building a model of um, city of London. So it, a city simulator where um, I realized that not all dimensions of a city can be rendered mathematically. There are important dimensions that are really tacit, that are basically soft, like the coolness of a city, you know? So um, I was a little bit, let's say, um, dissatisfied with the limitations of mathematics and science. So I went to a different path, which is depth psychology. So I started training as a psychoanalyst, understanding uh, nature of meaning and significance for individuals, basic worldviews that we have, some assumptions that we have, where do they come from, how do they shape our thoughts and our actions. So um, that was a, an alternative view on basically systems thinking, because that's still systems thinking, that's still seeking meaningful connections and interrelationships. Um, I've been a lecturer at universities in Switzerland for, for the past 12 years. Um, I lecture in different MBA programs. And the courses that I'm in, interested in is basically multidisciplinary courses, courses that connect. So systems thinking, design thinking, and so on and so forth. And re recently, I started with Peter, my friend, um, an initiative which is called Design Dissolve, in which we are having a multidisciplinary take on basically understanding and approaching design. At the end of this presentation, I'll briefly talk about what we offer as, uh, let's say, a set of training courses in the frame of design dissolve programs. Now, to answer the question, when is systemic design design? We first need to understand a bit about systems. What is systems? You know, if you place it on a conceptual or a semantic map, you know, we have systems, we have synthesis, we have synergy, we have symbols. On the other side, we have analysis, energy, and sign. If you look at the left-hand side, it's always about breaking things down into constituent elements. It's about elements rather than relationships. But on the right-hand side, we talk about um, some collective characteristics of elements that cannot be attributed to any of the elements individually. So a number of things come together and then they create a whole. And this whole, we cannot actually attribute it back to any of those elements. So there is something mystical happening here. For instance, a synergy, you know, when a number of people come together and they can achieve results that cannot be achieved by those members individually. When we talk about symbols, symbols point to something, some sort of a meaning, which is beyond that symbol, which is beyond that representation. So it's as if they want to tell us about something which is mysterious. They can't tell us what it is, but they can tell us something about it. That's the nature of a symbol. But on the other hand, we have signs which are designed in a way that do not create that richness in interpretation and in meaning. If you look, for instance, at its no smoking sign, it's designed in a way that nowhere, uh, no matter where in the world, no matter who is looking at it, it always gives the same meaning. So we are in the world of systems, we are on the right-hand side. It's about something mysterious, it's about something that we refer to as emergence. So when elements come together and create something as a whole, and that whole takes on some collective characteristics that cannot be understood in terms of the elements, then we have an emergent phenomenon. So, um, you have seen, for instance, the flocking of the birds. It's emergent. Like um, a molecule of water is also emergent because hydrogen and nitrogen do not have any liquid properties. Two gases come together and out of the chemical reaction between them, suddenly we have something which is liquid. So, and we can see a lot of emergences in nature around us, anything that takes the shape of a spiral, for instance, in nature, is a result of an emergent process. Now we have emergences also out of the natural world inside our, let's say, human activity systems or human social systems. For instance, love is an emergent phenomenon. Life itself is an emergent phenomenon. Wisdom is emergent. Becoming a leader, you know, having that, those qualities of a leader 
is an emergent phenomenon. You cannot go into a course and then learn how to become a leader and then walk out of it. It's something that emerges, those qualities. Anything which is soft skill related is also at the level of emergence happening. So you cannot break it down. Okay, how are you this charismatic as a leader? Or let me tell you how it is happening in the form of a couple of slides. It doesn't happen like this. It's something that you cannot put your finger on it. So um, in the world of design, we also have emergencies. You know, some designs create emergencies. In the world of arts, we have emergencies. So here we have a number of emergent, let's say, uh, phenomenon. One of them is a work of art by Jackson Pollock. So the one here is a Jackson Pollock's work of art. Anything else that you see here is a part of nature. We have a bush, we have the spider web, we have trees, branches. And um, what we can see here is that sometimes art becomes an extension of the nature by em embodying some sort of an emergence. So the question is, there's a very interesting um, documentary on the fractal uh, nature of Jackson Pollock's work. So I would highly recommend that you look, have a look at it to see how actually fractals are at work there and how these drawings or paintings of his are basically emergent. Um, when it goes to design, how do we see emergence? What is about it that is special? Why should we talk about emergencies? Um, I give you some examples here from architecture, and then um, basically I will continue again with some other examples. So there is a book by Christopher Alexander called The Timeless Way of Building. So he talks about some patterns that are alive. And he said these patterns of creating or differentiating space which are alive, they let our inner forces loose. They set us free. Otherwise, if they're not alive, they keep us locked in inner conflict. And basically what he's saying is that an architectural space, a room, the design of a room can help us resolve our inner complexes or conflicts that we have inside us, which is an emergent phenomenon of that. So if you go into a room and then suddenly you feel at peace, at one with yourself, that's an emergent phenomenon. He gives an example of two designs of two rooms, basically in comparison, he says, here, here we have a room in which the windows are holes in the wall. And then there is a sitting space, which is far from the windows. And here there is another one in which there is, there is light coming in and then their sitting space is actually close to the light. It says, if, you, if you're in this room, you wanna be comfortable, you wanna sit down after a while, but then you wanna be next to the, the light as well. You wanna be exposed to the light, but this room doesn't allow for those forces coming into a resolution together. And this act of not being able to reach an outer resolution influences some sort of inner conflict within us, creates some sort of an inner conflict within us. He talks about the structure of the cities right now, that we have some residential areas, we have work areas. He says, this is also an act of fragmentation. When you're at work, you feel somehow in conflict with yourself because part of you is thinking about your family and all those activities that are not work related. So um, when it comes to designing a product or a service, I would say if you're exposed to a product and service and you, have, you walk away with that, uh, from that experience with a feeling and they ask you, what made you feel like that? And you, you cannot put your finger on it. You can say, okay, you know, it was this feature. It was actually um, that dimension of the service that resulted in this feeling. I don't know actually what it was, but it felt like homecoming for me. It, I, I, it brought back some of my childhood memories. So it somehow made me feel playful, but you still don't know what exactly it was that made you feel like this. So the question that we have in systemic design is how can we create emergences? How can we design for emergences? That's a, an important question. This conflict and the forces, and you can also see it in a lot of works of art basically that in which there is some, you cannot see the forces very vividly, but these forces are in some sort of an equilibrium, in some form of a harmony. Therefore, when you look at this work of art, those ratios and those harmonies create an inner harmony inside you. So basically, 
The first take on the question, when is systemic design? Is systemic design is when we design for emergence. And when we approach design, design artifact from a phenomenological standpoint. What is phenomenology in design? Phenomenology is everything but the artifact itself. Is everything but the service or the product. Is basically the type of feelings, effects, type of, let's say, impressions, assumptions that people walk away with out of an experience or an encounter or interaction between them and an artifact. So we have to focus those. Our worldviews in, in design should allow for understanding the richness of the emergences that the product or the service is creating and somehow design for those, having those in mind. So design is not about the artifact from a phenomenological standpoint. It's about the impressions, the assumptions, the feelings, the type of tensions or resolutions that occur in the world of the users or the designers as well when they interact with the design artifact. That is when we are designing systemically. That's the first chapter about systems and emergences. Second one is about thinking. We need to understand the nature of thinking. I think it's super important when you talk about systemic design, thinking and its nature needs to be understood at a finer level of understanding. I would highly recommend you to read, read anything from David Baum. He was a physicist that then started looking into some profundities of life, moved away from technicalities of physics to profundities of life in his second half of life. And he has a book called On Dialogue. He says that um, if I say I'm going to look into my mind, I do not consider my assumptions, but I do not consider my assumptions, then the picture is wrong because the assumptions are looking. The assumptions are not looked at. The assumptions are looking. When looking at society or looking at another person, what you see depends on your assumptions and you will get an emotional reaction from that person which enters you and affects the way you see. This is so profound. So what he's talking about is that, uh, let's say, causal or feedback-based view of thinking that our assumptions determine our emotions because of the nature of the observations that occur. And those emotions will feed back into our assumptions again. So any act of thinking should help us in revealing the fundamental worldviews or assumptions that we have, somehow bring them into light. This is important. Otherwise, we are just looking through the lens of those assumptions. Um, another resource for, for you is this book that I always refer to is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I have learned so much from books that have not had the, the, the word design or thinking in their title. So if you move away from uh, those usual suspects, then you find really good gems. Talks about, the author talks about the fact that it's everything we see is a manifestation of a thought or a worldview, a way of looking. So he talks about a factory. If you bring it down, if you tear it apart, but the rationality that produced it is left standing, that rationality which will produce another factory, which is exactly the same. So that's basically those fundamental assumptions that David Bohm was talking about as well. In systemic design, we want to understand these patterns of thought, that those rationalities, those worldviews. And Gregory Bateson, who is a polymath, a sociologist, a psychologist, anthropologist, and a systems thinker, says that the major problems in the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way people think. There's a fundamental mismatch here. Our thinking does not match the nuances in the nature. Now, I wanna give you an example. So imagine one day you, you wake up and you feel happy. Next day, you feel sad. Again, another, you feel moody a little bit. Another day, you feel enthusiastic. So there is this one day good, one day bad happening. We can see that if we are smart enough, we can see there's a pattern to this. So maybe the fact that I was super hyped up yesterday is somehow accounting for the fact that I'm now 
feeling a bit down. So there is something here happening. There's a trend going down, a level of understanding, putting this into context. Another way of looking at this is to understand what is it that is giving rise to those patterns that I see out there. Now, imagine I'm, I was not feeling very well. Then I decided to drink. So for a, for a couple of days, I felt better. But then after, after that, again, I felt worse. So here we see basically there is some sort of a problem symptom. I'm not feeling well. I'm sad. I'm not happy, whatever it is that is happening. I try to suppress the symptom. So there is a symptomatic solution that is increasing here. And as this symptomatic solution is increasing, I'm building some resistance as well. So the same level of symptomatic solution is not going to work in the next iteration, the next cycle. But it's not all that is happening here. As I'm doing this, there is an unintended consequence which will suppress the fundamental solution because I will have some health problems. I will not be able to do some inner work. I cannot go socialize to understand the reasons for my sadness and so on and so forth. So these unintended consequences will deter and impede the implementation of a fundamental solution. And therefore the problem symptom stays strong. And therefore I'll try to basically apply more and more symptomatic solutions to it. And this is going to again result in strengthening the problem symptom. Now, what, what, why is this happening? Going one level down. Because I feel a necessity of quick problem solving. Because I just want to get rid of this feeling that I'm not well today. I'm not really in a good mood. I cannot stand that fact. I just want to do something about it. I'm probably very uh, reactive to it. I cannot hold this tension between how I'm feeling right now, how I would like to feel, basically. And then there is a reason here, there is another thing here that there is an un unintended consequence and that's nature. How nature works is that there are no shortcuts. Anything important in your life doesn't happen overnight. You have to spend time. You have to spend time into a fundamental way of approaching things. So when these, thing, these two things come together, they create a structure. So structure is symptomatic solution, unintended consequences of them. And this is a pattern of behavior that comes out of it. And this pattern of behavior can be viewed as one day I'm not feeling well, the next day I'm feeling better and so on and so forth. This pattern repeats itself again and again. So I can look at this in terms of an iceberg. So I can see that there is events up there. These events are somehow analogous with this structure of data information, knowledge, wisdom. And if, I, if you come down this iceberg, you will basically have a more profound understanding of what is happening you will have a better leverage. And um, in systemic design, what we want to do is to trace these emotions, feelings, reactions, as David Bohm was talking about them, trace them into the thoughts, the patterns of thoughts that generate them. Understand the archetypal nat uh, nature of basically our interactions with our environments, what are they imposing upon us? How do we think? How this combination of how we think, how the nature works results in the generation of a systemic structure and how this systemic structure can manifest in terms of patterns of behavior and how these patterns can be experienced in form of disconnected data points. So many of the interventions that we have are here at this level. So this level, Whatever you do, you're still impacted by that mode of thinking. So your interventions basically will aggravate the situation than improving it because you're still a prisoner of the way you think of those mental models or the worldviews that are flawed. And there's a reason why I have put this arrow in dotted form. And basically that is this cycle of data information, knowledge and results, and you know, measurement gives us data. This does not connect back to data, in my opinion. In my opinion, there is a uh, better way of looking at this is that it starts a next cycle and wisdom is an emergence of re repetitions and iterations of this basically pattern. We, we start with data, we 
analyze data, we get information. We then interpret information, we get knowledge, we act upon knowledge, we get results, we measure the results, we get new data. So when, when we become wiser, the way we collect data, the way we measure, the way we analyze, the way we interpret everything, there's a qualitative shift in every step of this process. We're not coming back to the beginning point. This is basically a spiral form that out of which we can have the emergence of wisdom. So this is the second bit I wanted to share with you, how to connect thoughts to um, basically emotions or what happens out there because there is this dissonance. Sometimes there is basically um, our decisions, our actions and the results are distant in time and space. So we do not have the luxury of seeing the consequences of what we basically do and the decisions that we take. But these patterns in, in systemic design would enable us to connect, to create these meaningful connections. So when is systemic design? Systemic design is when we move away from event level interventions to identifying trends and patterns of behavior over time, surfacing the underlying structures. It's when we inquire into assumptions and worldviews that um, uh, form our thinking and their sources. Where do they come from? So there is a very big and profound human dimension when it comes to systemic design, going back to the pattern of thought and their sources. Finally, chapter three is about models. Why models are important? What type of models? So here is... Um, Send us from Carl Weick. I forgot to put his name down there. Um, Carl Weick talks about a concept which is called sense making. He says, What is sense making? Sense making is substitution of a conceptual order for a perceptual one. So there is this interactivity between concepts and perceptions, ideas and experiences. So we have this um, double, double strand rope or this double helix of ideas and experiences. And what can create a connection between them, convergences between them is basically models. We need models in order to be able to make sense of our experiences, to convert our experiences into ideas. And these ideas will definitely shape the next experiences that we'll have. So there is some sort of uh, mutually reinforcing relationship between experiences and ideas. So we need models that can allow us conceptualize situations. Here's a key term, conceptualization of a situation, not models that are already conceptualized. We need to step, take a step back in order to um, relate our experiences and make some sense making out of them, we need to conceptualize our experiences, generate them into the for, in, in, into form of ideas and concepts. And then these ideas and concepts will be our guiding platforms for the next round of experience that we want to do. So this is an important point, models that allow us conceptualize. Bertrand Russell has a, a great uh, book called The Conquest of Happiness or pursuit of happiness, I think. One of, I think it's conquest of happiness. He talks about um, two elements that result in satisfaction at work. One is exercise of skills and the other one is construction. So, so you can construct something. Construction is delightful to contemplate and is never so fully completed that there is nothing further to do about it. What it means is that when you're working with a model, the model should give you basically the richness of being able to iterate with that and all the time look back at the situation and learn more about the situation. So the model is not a model that you fill it out and it's over, that's it. It's a model that allows you to iterate, which with each iteration, you refine your mental models. There is something you know about the way you think. There's some questions that you're asking that you could not ask beforehand. There are some dimensions that you are seeing that you could not see previously. In order for this to happen, we need to move towards models that are evocative 
as opposed to models that are analogous. What does this mean? So um, you're familiar with maps, you know, of different forms or drawings. In drawings, we try to, in maps, we try to build an analogous representation. Whatever in the map responds to something in reality. This is a blueprint, you know, but these models work very well in the physical world, in engineering and technical, let's say, type of inquiry or problem solving that we have. So now if we call one of the models that we use a service blueprint, it means we are using a metaphor of bringing something from the physical world, understanding a service by somehow breaking it down into its components. Whereas the service needs to be understood by a form of a model that allows for understanding of emergences into that, into that service, the result, result from that service, the connectivity between that service and other services, other dimensions of individuals' lives, the type of, let's say, inner patterns of thoughts or conflicts that can happen in the individuals when they are dealing with that service. So a one-to-one -one mapping between the physical dimensions of, of a service and uh, what is being experienced needs to be there in order to account for the human dimension in design. So this is a very important point. The metaphors we use are like those assumptions, those fundamental assumptions, they shape our actions. If you look, for instance, in the world of business, there's so much, so many words like um, we have, for instance, headquarters, we have chief operating officer, penetrating the market, guerrilla marketing. You look at these terminologies, they're all about language of war. The terminology is terminology of battlefield. So there is an underlying assumption that business is war. So our actions are formed by that thereby. And the same thing about the world of design. If we use terminology that connects us back to the physical design, industrial design paradigm, in which we were talking about physical objects, robustness analysis, reliability analysis of those, let's say products and, and what we were building as artifacts, then we will somehow destroy some richness here. What I would say is a, a model should be able to capture the dynamism of the situation where it needs to model. So the, we are familiar with the yin and yang, but some people speculate that the beginning of it is back actually this dynamic nature of the movement of the earth around sun when there's shadows and there's lights and there's an interplay and dance between the shadow and light that happens. It has to be multifaceted. We can't build models and we say, okay, this is clearly clear cut stuff, clear cut categories of things. We need to allow for basically some wonder standing, I, I would like to call it, some connection to mystery. You know, we're not nailing everything down as when we're dealing with a physical product. Some sor sort of basically um, room to wiggle in the model in which there is coexistence of opposites. Somehow we can understand some dimensions of reality better if this allows for that, the models that we are using. And finally, there has to be feedback. The Zen circle basically captures the feedback principle, whatever goes around, comes around. Linear models that march from left to right or top to bottom or right to left are not models that can give us insight about the different types of feedback that we can experience. Because feedback, this circularity of action somehow results in a richer understanding of the connections between our mental models or assumptions and their consequences. So finally, when is systemic design? Systemic design is when we accept and respect the uniqueness of design situations. Every design situation is unique. We need to accept it, we need to respect it. And we create our own learning devices along our sense-making journeys. So it's not about going there, grabbing something off the shelf, applying it, and then you hit a limit with that and you leave it and you get another thing off the shelf and you apply it. The reason why probably we have these many templates and models right now, 100 or uh, 150 of those templates around, hundreds of them is basically because they do not allow us for capturing those uh, rich dimensions that need to be captured. So this is basically my take on systemic design. I take a few more minutes to talk about what we do in Design and Dissolve and then 
I'll be happy to answer your questions. So we have an advanced um, program in systemic design, which is done with, with, a, with a university here in Switzerland, the Franklin University. Um, it, we have a number of assumptions here in our pedagogy and the design of our content. First of all, thinking is not synonymous with analysis. So an analytical thinking is one form of thinking. We situate it along other forms of thinking, which are synthetic thinking, lateral thinking, feedback thinking, creative thinking, holistic thinking, systems thinking. So we have to understand the nature of thinking better. Analytical thought is not sufficient and adequate for departing on the journey of sense-making in a human activity system. This is what we, what we believe. Then in the next part, we believe that um, thinking is only one function of our consciousness. So we need to understand other functions of our consciousness, intuition, sensation, and feeling, which have been historically suppressed in our education in the way we relate to the world. So intuition and feeling in particular, we do not know how to connect to our intuition and we do not know how to tap into our feelings and tap into the feelings of others. We're not taught those things. We don't follow, let's say, structures that can allow us to come into contact with these um, basically faculties. And finally, not everything in us as human beings is conscious. We have a multitude of unconscious processes that underlie our thinking, our activities, and our assumptions. Now, this gives us the structure for our program, which is organized in, in three different sets of modules. In the first one, we refine our thinking, two different types of systems thinking courses we have, one which is more on the philosophical side, understanding the notions, concepts of systems thinking and the attitude towards systems thinking, more than, uh, let's say, techniques. Next one, we dive deep into the techniques for model building, building maps of, let's say, systems that are in accordance with some theoretical insights that are rigorous and that can result in basically an understanding that cannot otherwise be achieved. And finally, in the, in the next module, we'll look at design beyond thinking. That's a play with words that we have with design thinking. We need to we believe we need to go beyond thinking. Once we explore thinking in its full capacity, the next step is to go beyond thinking and to explore the connection to the other functions of consciousness. And finally, we have a module on disciplined imagination, which is touch basing with um, those unconscious processes within us and understanding ourselves um, and basically those unconscious forces within us that are great sources of creativity and intuition for us. And if we tap into those, we can be creative and we can be imaginative. And that's something which is required in design and in systemic design. So with that, I'll end my presentation here. I'll be very happy to um, answer your questions. I hope you found these ideas useful. Virtual applause for me and the rest who's uh, here. Super interesting. Uh, thank you for sort of uh, reiterating what we also covered on the show. Uh, a lot of questions came up for me. Some are already uh, being added by uh, the participants. Um, we have about 20 minutes, so let's make um, the best use of our time. Um, we have two questions here. Uh, first one is by Anna and she asked, are there any examples of models for service design that you consider good? So I think this has to do with the contrast to a service blueprint, which isn't uh, ideal. Uh, and if I misunderstood your question, Anna, please uh, uh, sort of correct me, but models within service design for service design that you consider good. Yeah, very good, very good question. Well, I, I will, somehow elaborate on this question a little bit before answering it. Um, to me, service design is not a discipline. It's the way I look at it, service design is basically an intersection between disciplines. It's not a discipline on its own. We call something a discipline when it has theoretical underpinnings. There's a paradigm behind those. There is methodology, there is methods, there is tools, and there is templates to use. So we have a full range of things that need to be there before we go into a template, right? In service design, 
most of the stuff I've seen are templates are at the template level. That whenever we talk about a theory, those theories come from the outer fields, somewhere, somewhere else. So for me, um, looking at service design as a discipline is very reductive. It's reductive. We create a discipline which will be a shallow discipline because it is not, it doesn't have the depth that we have, for instance, in disciplines such as psychology, right? That has been studied, has been, there, there has been some theoretical developments in that field. It doesn't have the richness of disciplines in which there is strong theories like systems inquiry, systems, uh, system dynamics. So I would say, no, from my, where, where I come from, for me, those models do not take the basic, let's say properties to be called a model, you know, to, to allow for you to conceptualize a situation. A model is something that allows for you to conceptualize a situation, to turn um, basically a circumstance that you experience into a conceptual situation that you can understand. And then you can iterate on that. So they do not match that, those criteria in my view, but there is ways you can augment those, those models. So it's not that you should discard them completely. So with one of, one of the things that we do in our courses is that after students go through um, the plethora of the techniques and the theory that we introduced, we say, okay, now go back and have a look, a fresh look at the models that you've worked with. So um, how would you be able to improve those? From which standpoint? So the final assignment of the students can be basically something around this topic. How would I be able to um, add, to add some depth and dimension to those tools that are existing in the field? So it's possible to, to bring them to a level of usefulness that can generate insight. But at the, at the level where, where they are right now, I would say no. Clear. Uh, I have a lot of follow-up questions on that, but uh, let's. Uh, there are some really interesting uh, questions from the rest of the audience. Um, so um, here's a question from uh, Vincent, and uh, I think uh, he addresses a topic that uh, probably a lot of people feel. So, what should we change in our day-to-day -day service design practice to incorporate more of systemic thinking? Because um, it seems like a, a very a holistic and, um, and conceptual approach. How do you translate this into day-to-day -day behavior, habits, activities, beliefs? Yeah, great question. Um, well, this also <laughs> reminds me of our experience with our courses because after a couple of sessions, the participants come back and say, hey, I never expected to be able, I came here for a professional training course, something that I could use at work. But now it's giving me insight about my life, my relationship to uh, my partner, um, to myself and so on and so forth. So the beauty of systems thinking or, or the systemic paradigm is that it's context neutral. So it cannot be contained in a context. Once, you, once you're in touch with that, let's say richness, then it permeates your life. It, it cannot stop at, at the boundaries. Okay, this is work related and I'm gonna do completely something else elsewhere. So the thing is, what we do in our, in our course, um, we do a number of me mental exercises. So, okay, in one course, students learn about seven different type of mental exercises and activities that they should, I, I call them some sensors, systems sensors that they need to activate. And these will influence their observations, the way they see things, right? But the, the, the thing is that, it's more like an attitude systems thinking than a set of tools or techniques. So it's, it's an attitude in which, for instance, you should look, for instance, for um, meaningful similarities across seemingly different phenomena on a constant basis. So, okay, these two things are very different, but is there a thing that connects them, for instance? Looking for emergences in our daily lives and activities. That's another way of looking at things. Do I experience these emergencies? Do I create these emergencies in any shape or format? You know? So basically um, there are these activities and these, let's say um, exercises, they do not work in a short period of time. They're not short term. You have to engage with them over a long period. And then little by little, there will be some emergencies. Oh, the quality of my observations are changing. 
basically. My reactions are changing. That day I heard something. Normally I would have been angry, but I'm not today, you know? So um, there is then these emergencies that happen thanks to those things. It's not something off the shelf. You go, you take it and then say, okay, now I can apply it. And then it has an expiration date. It's a continuous engagement with this um, world around us and the world within us, basically. So this is what I would say systems thinking is. And that's how I saw a lot of systems thinking in analytical psychology. It's systems thinking. If you look at architecture, there's a lot of systems thinking in it. It's poetry, there's a lot of systems thinking. So it's not a discipline. Systems thinking in itself is not a discipline either. It's the approach to understanding systems thinking should be transdisciplinary as well. Got it. Um, let's move on into a question that I feel is related to this. Um, and this is a question from uh, Joey. Um, so his basic question is, how do you apply this uh, idea of systems thinking in a business concepts context where uh, a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders might consider it to be too complex and they're looking for simple solutions. So I recognize this challenge. Like there is, an, there is a need for short-term tangible outcomes. And in our episode, we talked about maybe you need to rethink the educational system to come up with, to dissolve some challenges. That's a hard, that, I can imagine that that's a hard sell in many business contexts. So what is your take on that? Um, I would say when, once you learn it, you know, once you embody systems thinking, then um, your approach to structuring the problem, to handling a meeting will be very different. So this thought that is too complex, I'm not going to pursue it. It's, I think is, is flawed. It is complex, but you don't have to face that um, complexity and you don't have to communicate that complexity at, mm -hmm. the, at the outset. You can start with, with very small exercises like for instance, what we talked about today, this iceberg view that I elaborated on, that's systemic. That's a beginning point into understanding systems, right? But it's, it's a good world. It's a good opening to this world. It's a good initiation into this world. So there could be tools that are not as elaborate or fully fledged as um, basically a lot of methodologies that are out there. Like for instance, in the system dynamics world, we use stocks and flows. You know, we spend, we spend seven weeks of our course to understand stocks and flows as a method. Only after that, the participants have a feeling that, yeah, I now know what this thing is and I can start working with this. It takes time for that to, to emerge. But then there is, there is smaller, let's say, um, portions or uh, bits that you could use in a systemic way that render some effect. They, they help those participants, those business participants see some other dimensions. For instance, we are, we are familiar with these canvases. One good question to ask is that, what about the relationships between these elements? Um, are these elements mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive? It means, is there everything covered by them, right? Or is there something that can fit into two boxes of this? These are some simple questions to ask. One simple thing I used to do is in the meetings, you go into a meeting and you want to talk about a certain situation. You translate that situation into a key variable. What is this variable that we are looking at here? What's the problem? Is it the sales that is reduced? Is it the user base that is somehow declining or the speed in the growth of the business is not accelerating, whatever? So, okay, can you be, draw a behavior over time graph for this variable for me? Ask 15 people around the table to graph it for you. How do they think this variable has been behaving over time five years ago, now, how do they think it's going to behave into, into future? Just one simple you know, time graph can, can surface a lot of the assumptions of the participants in that meeting. So, oh, wow. And then you see the similarities across the graphs that they have generated. What is, what is similar about this, you know? 
what is different about them? Why did they graph it like this? So that provides some dialogue opportunities that didn't exist before doing this exercise, which is simple, takes five minutes, but then there is important insights that can come out of it. So don't be scared by the, by the vision of where you want to. The des don't let the destination scare you away from taking the journey, basically. So there are, there are things you can do once you understand systems thinking as an attitude, not as a set of tools, then you can, it can somehow permeate all the activities that you are doing on a, on a daily basis. Your, your approach to organizing a meeting, to um, somehow drawing conclusions, to summarizing things, to synthesizing things will be different. It helps you to ask different questions. The, you know, yes. That's yeah, absolutely. And um, here's a question, a classic question. Uh, I think you've heard uh, often. Uh, it's one from Matilda, and she says she asks, "How do you define where the system starts and mostly ends?" That's a very good question. Um, in in systems, um, let's say the designing systems models, we always have this boundary condition. Right? What, what is exogenous to the model we are creating? What is endogenous to the model, right? It means what do we wish to influence by this, let's say by this initiative or what is influencing our initiative basically. So these are um, the things that we can, we have to accept that um, we cannot change. The things that we can change and we should attempt changing them. It reminds me of this serenity prayer says, God, give us the, um, the serenity to accept what we can change and the courage to change what we can and the wisdom to distinguish between the two. So this is the endogenous exogenous variables in the model. So this take, you know, systems thinking and systems modeling is more like a craft, right? So it's not uh, clear cut ways and procedures for building a model. You really have to engage in the act of model building and then you learn where you need to stop, where this is basically meeting the boundary condition. But what I'm saying, for instance, if you're modeling a bank, services of a bank, exchange rate is an exogenous variable, is nothing you could influence, right? But the number of users you're getting or number of new accounts that is being opened, that is an endogenously determined variable. What you do can influence that basically. And what that does influences what you do as well. So there is a feedback dynamic over there. So what I would say to, to respond to that question, yes. One thing is that it's not clear cut. They can say, okay, this is where your experience shows. Second thing that can help is that we never model a system. We model a problematic situation. That helps us draw a boundary around this. So one of the challenges we met in the city simulator we were building for London was that we were modeling London as a system of systems. And that is a huge. After thousands of variables, we were still not capturing some important dimensions of it. So we never model a system. We always model a problematic situation. And that can give us some ideas where to draw the boundaries around what we are trying to include in the model. And I think Pareto optimality, 80%, 20%, you know, 20% of the variables can capture 80% of the situation could be useful. You have to stop if you have an adequate representation of the situation that can exactly help you in asking questions that you would not ask beforehand. So that's a good place for you to stop, I would say. And uh, I would summarize your answer as just take a very pragmatic approach. If it, if it works for you, if it has the elements that it, uh, uh, you need to answer your questions, then you've probably you don't need to go beyond that. Uh, Arash, we have three minutes left. There are more questions that we can handle today. Let's do one more um, and uh, maybe you follow up in a different way uh, for the, uh, all the other questions. So uh, I'm going to pick a question by Tim because a few people have referenced something similar. And uh, Tim uh, comes back to your evocative models versus analogous models. And um, he asked, could you give an example of the former and its use case, e.g. a storyboard to explain the emotional impact of a service to align people on abstract elements um, of a service? So the distinction between the two models and the use case of analogous models. 
Yeah, um, I would say when we talk about evocative models is that, for instance, seeing patterns of causality, seeing feedback, this is not something you could, you could observe directly into, let's say, in, in a situation. It's something that uh, basically has to be discerned. That's why I'm, I'm calling it not analogous. Analogous is something that you see one element there, customer moved from this point to the other point. Okay, in the model, the customer also moves from this point to the other point. So in evocative models, we look into patterns of relationships that are not readily observable out there in the, in the universe of discourse that we are observing. So that is why I say it's evoked. And then that inquiry into the nature of those patterns will evoke questions, thoughts, right, in our mind. That's why I call it evocative models. So um, that's the distinction that needs to be made. For physical, for uh, technical engineering systems, this one-to-one -one mapping, this isomorphism is absolutely necessary. When you're doing, for instance, you're building a blueprint of, of a chip to be produced, it needs to match to the, to the to the last decimal place, the dimensions that are needed for, for that chip to be produced in. But when it comes to human activity systems, we need to think out of those observable physical dimensions. And this is not a, enough time to talk about this. Hopefully we'll be able to do some sort of a workshop in, in future in which we can look at a situation and then try to translate that into a model. So there is not, it's not a type of question I can tackle in a few minutes just uh, for now, I think, I hope that distinction that I made between evocative and, and analogous models would be, would be enough. Awesome. For the, Arash, maybe for the people who are still here, which are a lot, which is great, means that uh, we've been enjoying the content. If they want to continue the conversation or dive deeper into this topic, um, what are some final recommendations you can give? Yeah, I recommend them to take our courses, Design Dissolve, you know. So dissolve that design, go to our website, take our look at look at the program that we have designed. And um, we have we have been having an overwhelming response by the participants there. It's an it's a it's a place for dialogue amongst participants and learning. So there's emergences that we have experienced there, patterns of friendships between people that emerge out of the, those um, basically meetings. So I would highly recommend you to, to do that. Next thing I would recommend you, if you don't want to take the courses, look into content that is profound. Look into things that are not labeled for systems thinkers, for designers and stuff. Read philosophy, read fiction, read novels. Look at, look at poetry, be inspired by a wide variety of fields. This diversity will create emergences inside you as, as, as designers, as individuals, look into as many disconnected fields as possible and try to connect them to one another. So it's more like an attitude towards learning that needs to be shifted. I would recommend you to learn for learning, for the sake of learning, not learning that is geared towards some sort of practicality driven type of stuff. Expand your horizon of learning. And uh, this is what I can say again in a, in a minute or two. If you want more of this, Design Dissolve, we are doing uh, extensive deep dives into the world of thought, into the world of feelings, into the world of models, and we would like to have you with us in our journeys. Awesome. I've shared the link in the chat. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. I hope many people uh, join uh, and who knows, maybe we'll do a follow-up webinar yeah. workshop. Uh, it seems that it resonates with people. Arash, thanks uh, for coming on, uh, doing a follow-up to the episode of the Service Design Show uh, conversation. Um, for everybody who was here, thank you for spending the time with us. We really, really, really appreciate you. Um, leave a comment on LinkedIn or something like that. If you enjoyed the webinar, we'll post a recording uh, within a few days on YouTube. Uh, so you'll be able to watch everything we said once again. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Arash, and have Thanks, an awesome Tuesday. Yeah, take care and keep safe, everyone. Till later. Bye. See you.